last year when I was here, you all sang a song that I had never heard before. In fact, I looked over at Martha Peace and I said, have you ever heard that song? And she said, no, I haven't. So I quickly wrote it down and when we got back to the hotel, I looked it up and I actually found out that it was a remake of an old hymn. And you might say, well, why are you bringing that up now? Well, the words of the song that we sang last year remind me of where we find Hannah as we begin our second lesson, as well as her second prayer she prays. And before I share the words of the song, which by the way, we're gonna end with in just a minute, I wanna just remind yourself of just a few things. Hannah is one of Elkina's two wives. I see some ladies coming in, so I'll give them a little review here. Penina was the other. Hannah, Hannah was barren, Penina had children. And remember, Penina provoked her relentlessly year after year. And Hannah, because she couldn't have a child, which was a disgrace for a Jewish woman, pours out her soul to the Lord regarding her barrenness, and she makes a vow. Lord, if you will give me a child, I will give him back to you forever. Eli sees her praying. She thinks she's drunk. He falsely accuses her because she, he doesn't hear anything coming out of her mouth. She does conceive, and now the time has come after weaning Samuel at the age of around three to take him to the temple to Eli to leave forever so he can serve the Lord. Now, what is going on through her mind right now? How in the world can Hannah do this? How can Hannah leave her three-year-old child in the care of Eli, the priest, whose sons were evil and worthless? You know how she's going to do this? She's going to be able to do this because God will hold her fast. That's the song you guys sang last year. He will hold me fast. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I can never keep my hold. He will hold me fast, for my love is often cold. He must hold me fast. And I won't go on through the rest of the song. Ladies, God is the only one that can hold Hannah fast through a time like this. And you know what? He's the same God that can hold you fast no matter what you are going through this evening, no matter what overwhelming trial you're facing. And so she's able to pray. And we see her second prayer in 1 Samuel 2. So if you would, read it with me. Hannah prays and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. No one is holy like the Lord. There is none beside you. There is not any rock like our God. Talk no more proudly. Let not arrogance come out of your mouth. For the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him are actions weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and those who stumbled are girded with strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, and the hungry have ceased to hunger. Even the barren has borne seven, and she who has many children has become feeble. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave. He brings up. The Lord makes poor. He makes rich. He brings low. He lifts up. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes and makes them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's. He set the world upon them. He'll guard the feet of his saints. But the wicked will be silent in darkness for by strength no man will prevail. The adversaries of the Lord will be broken in pieces. From heaven he'll thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He'll give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Then Elkinah went to the house of Ramah, but the child ministered to the Lord before Eli the priest. Now we're going to continue on looking at Hannah's heart through her prayers. And in this session, we're going to look at her heart as revealed through her prayers. We're going to see her happy heart, her hungry heart, and her honest heart. So let's look at her happy heart. Hannah prays and says, my heart is rejoicing in the Lord. My horn is exalted. I smile at my enemies. I rejoice in your salvation. Now, before we get into this prayer, I just want to uh, make a disclaimer here. A lot of the prayers that are in the Old Testament have two meanings. They have a current meaning, and we're going to look at it in its current meaning through Hannah and what's going on in her life but also messianic, in other words, for the future. And so this also is a future messianic prayer, but for our purposes, like I said, we are going to look at it uh, as from the heart of Hannah. So we must ask the question before we get started, 
When did Hannah pray this? When did Hannah pray this prayer? According to verse 28 that we just looked at at chapter 1, she had just told Eli, I'm the one that prayed for this child. I'm the one that's giving him back to the Lord. And then in verse 11 of chapter 2, after she prays this prayer, they leave Shiloh and they head back to their home in Ramah. So somewhere between telling Eli, I'm the woman that prayed this prayer, I'm the woman you falsely accused, she prays this prayer before they leave little Samuel and go back. I don't know what the Bible doesn't tell us. I think Hannah probably went off to some secluded place to pray. My thought is she probably gathered up little Samuel. I mean, you know, she's, not, she's gonna leave him there. She probably gathered him tightly in her arms. She may even prayed this prayer in his ears. Who knows? This is the last time she's gonna see him till she goes up and takes that uh, little coat to him. We do not know, but we do know she prayed. And the first thing out of her mouth is, my heart is rejoicing. <laughs> My heart is happy. And notice, ladies, who she's rejoicing in. Did you notice what the, word, what the verse says? My heart is rejoicing in what? The Lord. The Lord. You know, it's the same thing that Paul writes when he's sitting in prison chained to two Roman soldiers. When he says rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. How could Paul rejoice there in prison knowing that he's probably going to behead, be beheaded by Nero? How could he do that? Because his rejoicing was what? in the Lord and my dear sister you and I can pray this and we can live this no matter what we can be joyful no matter what in fact the word rejoicing here means to be joyful Hannah's joyful you know we would think in the 21st century if this was us we would be mourning and weeping that I have to leave my three-year-old son that I just weaned and leave him with this pastor that's wicked and evil are you kidding me but it's a time of rejoicing. How could she do that? Was Hannah in denial about Samuel? No, no. Again, something very similar, the Apostle Paul tells us, sorrowful, but always rejoicing. Sorrowful, but always rejoicing. Ladies, we can be going through the worst times of our life, sorrowful, sorrowing over something, and at the same time, rejoicing. Well, Hannah gives several reasons why her heart is happy. First of all, she says, my horn is exalted. What is that? Well, a horn is a symbol of power. You know what she's saying? God's power has been shown to me by answering my prayer. God's power is shown to me by giving me the strength to give this child back to him. Ladies, God's power, his strength is enough for any of his children. The same power that God gave to Hannah, he can give to you. And he will give to you. In our weakness, his strength is made perfect. Secondly, her heart is happy because she can smile at her enemies. Now notice she's not resentful, she's smiling at them. Now who are her enemies? Well, Penina is one of them, right? The other woman, the one who provoked her constantly, Eli probably an enemy as he falsely accused her of being drunk. But you know what? She wasn't ruffled by either one of them. I can smile at this. That's okay. You know, as God's daughters, ladies, we need to learn a lot from Hannah. We can smile at these things. Who cares if somebody provokes us? Who cares if somebody punches us out? Who cares if somebody falsely accuses us? Ladies, God is still on the throne. And we're going to make many enemies in this life. You know, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. We're going to make a lot of enemies in this life. There is no reason to lose our sanctification over it, okay? God is still on the throne. We have the Lord. He's enough, right? Is the Lord enough to you? He's enough. Well, the Lord is enough. And that's the third reason for her happy heart. She says, I'm rejoicing in my salvation. It didn't matter to her. I don't care what's going on. I'm going to rejoice in my salvation. He will hold me fast. That's all I need. Ladies, she was God, God's and God was hers. She was secure under the shadow of the eye almighty. Well, Hannah's heart was happy indeed, and her heart was also hungry, as seen in verses 2 to 10. Now you might say, well, Susan, what do you mean about that? What do you mean when you're saying her heart was hungry? Well, consider Job. Remember Job? Now here's a man, he didn't just give up one child like Hannah's getting ready to do. Job lost 10 children in one day. 
One day, his whole, all children of his children gone, all of his substance gone. A wife that was not a great wife and you know all these boils all over him you know what he says he knows the way I take and when he has tried me I will come forth as gold my foot has held his steps his way I've kept I've not declined neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips listen to this I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food how in the world did Job go through the trial he went through he was hungry for God. He was more hungry for God than he was for food. Or consider Paul praying again in prison, chained to two soldiers 24 hours a day, having been beaten, waiting to be beheaded by Nero. And you know what he says to the church at Philippi? Doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and be found in him not having my own righteousness, but his righteousness, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I might know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, what? Being made conformable to his death. Paul says, I don't care about any of this. I just want to know him. Paul wanted to know God more than he cared about food. In fact, the Paul probably didn't have any food in prison. Ladies, Paul, Hannah, Job, they were more interested in knowing God than they were their own comfort. They were hungry for God and God alone. You know, even the psalmist, when he's out in the middle of the wilderness, he says, your words are like, like uh, marrow and fat. <laughs> I can't, I can't get to church to worship, but he says, your words to me are like the, the choicest of the best foods, that marrow and fatness. Ladies, Hannah's heart was obviously hungry. She knew who this God was. She knew his attributes. And that's what sustained her and held her fast during her trial. And ladies, if you do not know God, and I don't mean in the sense of salvation, if you don't know God, you're going to, mess up anyway but if you don't know God in the sense of who he is and his attributes your strength will fail in the time of adversity and that's why you need to be here tomorrow when we start we're going to look into who this God is Hannah knew her God that's how he that's how she could do this well let's peer into her hungry heart and learn what her hungry heart what her hunger for God taught her notice what she says no one's holy like the Lord there's none beside you there's not any rock like our God. The first thing that Hannah knew about God was that he was holy. <laughs> no one's holy like God. You know, it's interesting that she starts out with this because even in the New Testament, when Jesus is teaching the disciples how to pray, you know what he says? And when you pray, say what? Our Father who art in heaven. Holy. What does that mean? Holy. Holy. You know, we come so flippantly to the throne of grace and say, okay, Lord, I'm getting ready to walk out the door and I need you to do this for me. I need you to do that for me. And da 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 we don't stop and realize we are talking to a holy God. Hannah says there's no one holy like the Lord. All other gods are nothing compared to him. He's indescribable. No one compares to him. Ladies, Hannah understood there's none like her God. No one understood her. Her husband didn't understand her. He thought he should be better to her than ten sons. The other woman, Penina, didn't understand her. She wanted to take her out. Eli, the priest, didn't even understand her. No one understood Hannah but God. Why? He, he knows her, right? He knows her heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? God. <laughs> God, he's the only one. Thirdly, Hannah knows there's no rock like her God. There's no foundation like him. When she's talking about a rock here, she's talking about something that's stable, unmovable, not little pebbles, a big rock. Ladies, he's our rock too. He is the same yesterday, today, forever. He will never leave her, never. He'll never leave you either. Hannah knew God was holy. She knew he was like no other God, and she knew he was a rock. But she also knew something else about her great God. Look at verse 3. Talk no more very proudly. Let not arrogance come out of your mouth, for the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. Now the reference here to being proud is probably a reference to Penina. Remember she had that arrogant speech. <laughs> as well as Eli's false accusation of her, prideful. Ladies, those who choose to use their mouth for prideful and arrogant speech are in danger. Why? Notice what she says. God knows this. 
He's the God of knowledge. He possesses all wisdom. He weighs our actions. And in the Hebrew, weighing our action means in a bad way. They're weighed in a bad way. They're estimated by him. These are people that are not doing good things. Actions that are performances in a bad way. Ladies, he is the one who will judge all things. Do you know God is the one who's going to make all things right on that day? You know, Jesus is clear in Matthew I say to you, every idle word that men will speak, they will give an account in the day of judgment. By your words, you'll be justified, or by your words, you'll be condemned. One day, Penina is going to stand before the Lord and give an account for those words she spoke. <laughs> One day, Eli will stand before the Lord and give an account. One day, you and I will stand before the Lord and give an account. Ladies, this should cause us to pause before using our mouths to provoke anyone or speak evil or ungodly or use our mouths to falsely accuse like Eli did. You know, the Proverbs 31 woman says she had the law of kindness on her lips. The law of kindness. And so should we. Hannah did. Hannah knew that God was a God of knowledge, a God of justice, but she also knew something else about her God from verse 4. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and those who stumbled are girded with strength. Now, the word broken means crushed and afraid, and the bows of mighty men is probably a reference to Eli's sons who were destroyed because God killed them for their wickedness. You know what? Eli's sons, they were once the sons of a priest, and now they are in hell. <laughs> You know, God's not going to be mocked. He will not be mocked. They were once mighty men, now they're broken. But in contrast, notice what she prays here. Those who stumble are now girded with strength. In fact, the girding here is being bound with strength. This is a reference to Hannah. She's talking about herself. I was once weak. I was stumbling. I was without a child. <laughs> but now I'm clothed with strength. I've been shown the power of God. He's answered my prayer. He's given me a child. And he's going to give me the strength to give him back to him. Ladies, Hannah knew her God was just and strong. She also goes on to pray in verse 5 to 7. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread. The hungry have ceased to hunger. Even the barren is born seven. And she who has had many children became feeble. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave, brings up. The Lord makes poor, makes rich. He brings low and he lifts up. You know what this verse is a contrast of? The two women, Penina and Hannah. Penina was full in the beginning, right? In the sense she had children. Hannah was hungry. She had no child. But now notice what she says. She has ceased to hunger. Why? Because she had a child. In fact, do you know from verse 21 of chapter 2, if you'll look over there, she had five more. The Lord visited Hannah, she conceived, she bore three sons, two daughters, and the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Now you might say, well, Susan, she says the barren bore seven, but in my math is Samuel's one, and five more is six. So why doesn't she say, you know, the barren has borne six? Well, seven in scripture is a number of completion. And even though Hannah only had six children, she was complete. She who was once barren, once hungry, has now born seven. Her quiver was full. She was blessed. She was once hungry and empty, and now she's full. Penina, on the other hand, she was full. She used to have, she had a lot of children, but now she's feeble. Now, there's no other mention of Penina. So we can only assume what happened to her. I don't know what happened to her. I do know the Bible says that envy and jealousy is like rottenness to your bones. So I'm thinking if she's feeble, you know exactly what's happened to her. She's got osteoporosis. Because ladies, you better cut that envy out. Listen to Proverbs 14, 30. A sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to your bones. So I'm not saying if you're hunched over tonight that you have envy. But you know what? Envy and jealousy can affect your bodies. Penina was obviously very envious of him. And because, you know, he, Elkina loved her. He loved her more than Penina. And he gave her a double portion. And she was the favored one. So I don't know what happened to her. But the Bible says, you know, she once was full and now she's feeble. I have no idea, but I think she got osteoporosis. 
Well, Hannah recognizes God is sovereign in all of this. As he kills, he makes alive, she says. He brings down to the grave, he brings up. Ladies, he's not only sovereign in how many children you have, he's sovereign in life, he's sovereign in death, he's sovereign in how much money you have or how much you don't have. He brings low, he lifts up. Ladies, Hannah knew that God was sovereign over everything. In fact, Job says this in Job 14, 5, my days are determined, the number of my months are with you. You have appointed my bounds, I can't even pass. <laughs> you know, Paul says that in the Sermon on Mars Hills. He says, God is Lord, he's Lord of heaven and earth. He's determined our pre-appointed times and the boundaries of our dwellings. Did you know that? Do you know you're not gonna die one day before God says you're gonna die? He's sovereign. Hannah knew this. He, she knew this about her God. You know, I think it's funny. Sometimes we have, we have some delusion that we have control over our lives, you know? We, you know, how many children we're going to have, who we're going to marry, you know, where we're going to be buried. And ladies, nothing further. In fact, last year I thought it was so funny during the election. You know, the, the media had it all figured out who was going to win. And, you know, they, were, they had it dead wrong. We think we're in control of what's going to happen. Nothing's further from the truth. God is the one who what? He's in control of everything. He sets up kings, takes them down. He's determined how many kids you're going to have, who you're going to marry. He's sovereign. Well, he's not only sovereign, but everything is upheld by him. Look at verse 8. He raises the poor from the dust and like the beggar from the ash heap. He sets them among the princes and makes them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's. He set the world upon them. Again, the raising of the poor here is a reference to Hannah herself. I was a beggar from the ash heap. In fact, the word ash heap is a pile of filth or poop. That's what it is. That's how Hannah's describing herself. I was the lowliest of the low. I was the scum of the earth. You know what she says now? God, but God has set me among the princes. What she's talking about? Well, put it together. Put two and two together. She's getting ready to what? Give over her son to Eli, and Samuel's going to what? Get to serve the priest. He's going to get to serve the Lord, the prince of princes in the temple. My son is going to get to serve the Lord. I was the lowliest among the low, but now my child is going to serve God. How is this possible? Notice, for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's. He set the world upon them. You know why it's possible? Nothing's too hard for the Lord. He can do it. He upholds everything. He's the creator. He's the sustainer. And he's also a God of mercy and wrath, as mentioned in verse 9. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked will be silent in darkness. For by strength no man will prevail. He will guard the feet of his saints. Hannah could pray that with gusto. <laughs> He's guarded my feet. He's protected me. He's guided me. He's been my good shepherd through this dark valley. He's held me fast. But in contrast, notice what she says. The wicked will be silent in darkness. Those who do not know this, God will be destroyed. They will be in misery. Ladies, this is obviously a reference to the wicked being in internal darkness and eternity in hell. You know, I was thinking about this week. Four months ago, my brother went to a Christless eternity, March 17th. And I've been thinking about that. For four months now, he's been in hell, eternal darkness, for four months. I've thought about, what is that like? The wicked, he will destroy. No man's going to get out of it. God is sovereign in that as well. <laughs> the wicked will be silent in darkness you know some of us think we can determine our destination but nothing is further from the truth in fact the lesbian Unitarian um, pastor I call that very loosely that buried my brother the Lord was gracious that I didn't have to go to that memorial service confirmed to my sister that she knew my brother went to be with the Lord and I told my sister no our, our brother is not in heaven some people think they can determine their destination. Ladies, nothing's further from the truth. Hannah says, for by strength, no man will prevail. No man, no woman, no matter how strong we think we are, we cannot prevail against what God decides. 
He's sovereign. Hannah knew this God, the God of mercy as well as the God of wrath. Well, there are two more truths that Hannah prays about this awesome God of hers as her prayer closes in verse 10. The adversaries of the Lord will be broken in pieces from heaven. He will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. So she mentions the adversaries of the Lord, and that again is probably a reference to Penina or Eli's sons or any of the enemies of God. They're going to be broken in pieces. They're going to be shattered. They will not be able to stand. How will this happen? She says thunder from heaven. Ladies, any time thunder is mentioned in Scripture, it's a sign of God's judgment. He will thunder. He is angry. He will judge the ends of the earth. Ladies, God is the judge of the earth. We are not. <laughs> she says he will give strength to his king. He will exalt the horn of his anointed. Hannah's now looking to the future. The future when the judge of the earth will make his final judgment. And as Nikki said, even so, come Lord Jesus, any time would be good. Then our king, Christ, will come and set up his kingdom. And Hannah's heart was looking towards this. This was her expectation this was her hope, and I hope it's your expectation and your hope. Her God was king. Well, Hannah's heart was hungry. It was hungry for God, and she studied to know who this God was that she served. She knew her God, and that's why she could pray this rich prayer. She knew God was holy. She knew there was no one like him. He was a rock, all-knowing, just, sovereign, creator, sustainer, judge of all the earth and king. Do you know that about your God? He's all those things. Well, Hannah's prayer is ended, but we see one more thing about her heart as we close with verse 11. We see her honest heart. Elkanah went to his house at Ramah, but the child ministered to the Lord before Eli, the priest. They leave and go home to Ramah. Samuel came with them, but Samuel does not return with them. Samuel stays and ministers to the Lord before Eli, the priest. But you know what? Hannah's heart was far from hypocritical. She kept her promise. She was honest. Her yes was yes. She made a vow to the Lord. She fulfilled her vow. She kept her promise. She gave up little Samuel to the Lord at the age of three. So Hannah's heart was happy. She could rejoice. She could smile. Her heart was happy. Her happiness was not dependent on her circumstances. Her happiness was dependent on her relationship with her God. Her rejoicing was in the Lord. What about you? Are you rejoicing in the Lord tonight? Are you smiling at your enemies? Are you smiling at the future? When you pray, does God hear your voice rejoicing in him or whining to him about your awful lot in life? Now, ladies, this doesn't mean we don't pour out our complaint to the Lord. Hannah did. But even in our pouring our heart out to the Lord, we can rejoice. Remember, sorrowful, but always rejoicing. Hannah's heart was also hungry. She knew God. What are you hungry for? Do you know your God so well that in the day of adversity your strength will stand as you rehearse the attributes of God like Hannah did? Is your God small or is he big? Ladies, a lot of what you think about God is in direct relation to the study of his word. Do you have an appetite for the word of God? Is it your sustenance? If not, what are you hungry for? Pleasure? Sports? Material things? Your job? Your business? You know, there's a preface in the Geneva Bible which was loved by the Puritans which reads like this. The Bible is the light to our path, the key of kingdom of heaven, our comfort in our affliction, our shield, and soared against Satan. The school of all wisdom, the glad wherein we behold God's face, the testimony of his favor, and the only food and nourishment of our souls. 
Is that how you feel about God's word? Is it the only food and nourishment of your soul? Hannah was hungry to know God. Are you hungry to know God? Hannah also had an honest heart. She kept her promise to the Lord. Have you kept your promises to the Lord? What promises have you made to him? I know of one promise that every one of you have made in here if you've committed your life to his lordship, and that is to follow him, right? Obey him in everything. Are you keeping that promise to his lordship? Are you obeying him in everything? Hannah also made a promise to her husband that she'd give up the child. Are you keeping your promises to your husband? You know, you made a promise when you got married. Well, at least I did. Till death do us part, better for worse, sick, rich or poor. Right? To be submissive. I know they leave all that stuff out now in weddings, but I made those vows. Are you keeping your promises to your husband, to your children, to your friends, people here at church? Well, as we close, the song I mentioned in the beginning, He Will Hold Me Fast, was actually written in 1906 by a woman named Ada Hybershine. I don't know if you know the history behind this song. And the song was actually born during a revival meeting during Canada. In Canada, that there was about 4,000 people that were attending this uh, revival. And one of the young men that was attending the revival came up to Ada, and he said to her, he said, you know, I just don't know if I'm going to be able to hold on to my faith. <laughs> and so she wrote this song, and it was introduced to this audience of 4,000 people. And I've asked the worship team to come up, and we're going to close with this. But ladies, as we go, as we sing this song, think about your fears, think about your trials. And as you do that, think through this song, and remember that God will hold you fast through whatever trial he brings into your life through his sovereign will. Mm -hmm.